Well, it's so good to be with you all. My name is Joe Scavato, for those of you that I haven't met. And I'm curious, as we start our time together, as you look at your life, when is the last time that you found yourself simply being still? When was the last time you found yourself just being still? If you're anything like me, I would argue that this idea of stillness is just that, an idea more than it is a reality. It's, it's kind of something like going to the gym. Like, I know I should do it. I know it's important. I know it will help me. But have you seen my schedule? I don't have this time in my life to be still. In fact, I would say that we as people have been hardwired against stillness. And my proof to you, all you would have to do to see that is to go and take a road trip with your family. I remember as a kid, our family would go on these family vacations, and more often than not, we would pack everyone into the minivan, and, and we would take these road trips, and we're going to Florida or wherever, and, and we would wake up at 5 a.m., and for the next 15 hours, my brother and I would play a game called How Close Can We Get Our Parents to Losing Their Minds? and we would get really, really close. You see, we, we had all the tricks. We learned them all, and I know we have some kids and students here, and this is the only time you're gonna hear don't take notes from the preacher, okay? I don't condone what we did, but we would do, you know, we'd put our hand like an inch away from the other one's face. You know, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. This is okay. We would do that. We would, then of course that would lead to actually fighting each other, which was always a good time. We would ask to stop at every single McDonald's we saw on the highway, which there's like a thousand of them. Um, and then of course, the classic, are we there yet? Every half hour we so, or, or so, we would throw that one out there, and, and we just thought that was the height of comedy, and eventually my parents would just be like, yes, get out, and they thought that was the height of comedy, and uh, it was, I don't know how we ever got to where we wanted to go. But they would do everything that they could. You know, we played the silent game, and, and that would last for like 45 seconds, and at some point, one of them would turn around, and in this moment of anger and pleading, they would say these words, won't you just keep still? Stillness is what we're talking about today as we're continuing in this series, Songs of the Soul. As we've been looking at the book of Psalms, and today we're going to be discovering Psalm 46, which is all about stillness. One of the things we've learned from the Psalms so far, if you've been with us, is that there's no human emotion or experience that isn't allowed in the Psalms. Even so far, we've seen everything from glory and wonder of who God is to sorrow and lament in life's darkest moments. And many of these things have come just as a natural part of life, but today we're going to be looking at something that I would argue we are hardwired against, what it means to be still. Many of you might be familiar with one of the verses we're going to be reading, Psalm 46.10, that says, Be still and know that I am God. That's one of those verses they put on coffee mugs and stitch onto pillows and, and share on Facebook and other places. In fact, I saw this picture on my Facebook feed as I was preparing for this message, and so I'm pretty sure Facebook is spying on me, but it's probably fine. Um, but, but I, and maybe even you have something in your home that looks like this or maybe a little different, but this decoration or a painting or something that reminds you of these words. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I don't know about you, but, but to me, when I hear those words, I, I think of this calm and peaceful moment, maybe getting somewhere where there's no distractions and I can just find peace. But today, our goal is to look at the entirety of this psalm and ask ourselves, what place does stillness have in your life and in mine? So I'm going to read to you today Psalm 46, and we're going to talk about it just a little bit. Verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then here's our verse. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So what does it mean to be still and to know that he is God? In this psalm, there are three things, three truths about who God is that I believe can bring stillness into our lives. See, God is seen here as our refuge, he's seen as our river, and he's seen as our rest. And so I want to start and talk about God as our refuge. God, our refuge. Have you ever seen one of those shows that are all about, they call them doomsday preppers? Uh, these are the people, if you haven't seen it, they're, they're convinced for whatever reason that the end times are coming or World War III is coming or the zombie apocalypse is coming and, and they are ready for it. And so this shows they, they follow these people around and they interview them and they, they show everything that they've done to prepare for this moment. And you, you show it and they, they go and they have like these bomb shelters and they've got rations of food for, you know, years and they've got power generators in case electricity goes away. Um, and some of them have these arsenal of weapons and it's a little worrisome to me with some of these people. But, but you know, this is serious business. They are ready for this moment. And I say all that to tell you that one day you're going to turn on one of those shows and my wife is going to be interviewed. Judy and I have lived in, in three different places since we've been married, and every place that we've gone, we, she, have developed a, a plan, an emergency plan for what to do if something happens. And we have meeting places that we'll go to if we get separated. We've got a plan for our dog. We've got gallons of water hidden in random places. We've got code names. No, we don't have code names. I want code names. She said no to that one. But, but we are, we are from, and I give her a hard time about it, and honestly, I think that's fair. Um, but I also know that if something does happen, I'm pretty sure we're going to be fine. And you guys should probably come find us, and we've got food and water. We'll, we'll be set. We're, we'll get through the zombie apocalypse together. But there's something about us as people, right, that, that naturally seeks out refuge. There's something in us that we seek out safety and comfort and strength. It's just part of our nature. And it's something that we see as we look at the first three verses of this psalm. If you look there with me, you'll notice that there are these instructions before the first verse, these musical instructions, because this is a song, remember? And, and we see who this psalm is written to, to the choir master. We see who it's written by, the sons of Korah, which were a songwriting group of the time. And then we see this little phrase, according to Alamoth which most people believe was instructions for the soprano voices to sing this song. And so I'm going to read this in my soprano voice. No, I'm not going to do that. Just making sure you're awake. Let me read these first three verses for you, though. It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear that the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Do you have a place in your life that you consider to be a refuge? I remember as kids, we would play, you know, there'd always be like home base, this place where you couldn't get tagged or you couldn't get out. For my fellow introverts in the room today, maybe you feel that way when you get home and it's like in your own little bubble that you've arrived at and, you know, you're protected from the world. Maybe a refuge for you is a place that you've been. Maybe it's sitting on the beach or a cabin in the woods, and whenever you've gone there, you've just felt this sense of peace. But there's something in our nature that naturally seeks that out. We seek out refuge, and it extends far beyond the physical and into every part of our lives. That's what these verses are speaking to. Throughout this psalm, there's this contrast that you're going to see. A contrast between the storms of the world, the seas roaring and the mountains trembling, put against the strength of our God. This word refuge just simply means shelter, a place to go for protection when there's a storm going on. It's this idea that if you've come here today and you're feeling stressed or anxious or worried or, or nervous about something in your life, that each one of us has something in common. 
we all turn to something or someone for refuge. We all turn to something or someone for refuge. But there's something else here that that we need to know in order to get what this psalm is going to teach us. See, most of the time when we think of this word refuge, if you're like me, you think of a, a place to go to, a destination to arrive at. You think of a home base to not get tagged out. You think of a quiet place that you've been to. Maybe you even think of refugees and people who literally leave their country for the safety of another. Most of the time, we think of refuge as a destination, but look at what this verse says about God. It says, God is our refuge, he is our strength, and that he is a very present help in trouble. He is already present in your life. He's already present in your storm. He already knows how you feel. He knows the pain in your life. He knows the chaos that is going on around you. And he is strong enough to handle it. We don't have to find refuge because refuge has already found us. It's this picture of the promise that was given to us from the life of Christ that we don't have to find God because God came into the world to find you. He came into the world to find me. That is our refuge. And so the question for us today, then, is a simple one. Where do you look to for refuge? In the things going on in the world, but also in your life. In things like loss and grief, in anxiety and depression, in job loss and sickness and worry. Where do you look to for strength? When things get difficult, do you seek refuge in God, or is it in the things of this world? Is it in God or is it in things like financial security? In things like success in your career? Is your refuge in your political party? Is it in having the appearance that you have it all together so no one knows any better? See, here's the problem when we do things like that, is that the problem isn't those things are necessarily evil. It's that not a single one of those things are eternal. And there is not a single refuge the world can offer you that can promise you tomorrow. And the point that this psalm is making to us today that that we need to learn as we look at our lives is that there is only one refuge, one protection, one shelter that is forever. And the good news is he has already found you. He is already here. He's given you his spirit. He's given you prayer. He's given you his word. He's given you this community that you can belong to. And all of those things can be your strength when you need it. And because of that, look at what verse 2 says. We no longer have to fear. Not because we are enough, but because we know the one who is. God is our refuge. It goes on to show us that God is also our river. God, our river. I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I have a distinct memory as a child of getting lost in the grocery store. Has that ever happened to you? I remember I was pretty young, and and I was with my mom, and and we were just walking around, and I'm sure I got distracted by something, and, and all of a sudden, she was gone. And that's like the scariest thing as a kid, right? You know, you have nightmares about that, or at least I did. And, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of freaking out. But luckily for me, my mom was a worrier. And she had planned for this moment. And she had told us that if anything like this happened, that all we had to do is just stay put. Just stay where you are. Don't move. Don't talk to anyone. Don't eat food off the shelves. Just stay put, and I will come find you. Now, unluckily for me, I did not remember that plan. And so I started to, to kind of let fear and panic take over, and, and there were two things that, that really scared me. First of all, I couldn't see her, and second of all, I called out for her, and I couldn't hear her voice. And in my head and in my fears, that led me to believe that she had left and forgotten about me. And so I'm like, oh man, like, this is the worst, like, I, I'm stuck here, I'm going to have to live in this jewel Osco, like, why well, couldn't have at least been a Trader Joe's, that would have been okay, and, and so I'm, I'm freaking out, and so instead of staying where I'm supposed to be, I go out, and I'm wandering around the store looking for her. 
And after what felt like forever, but probably was like five minutes, um, I I hear her voice. You see, as I was looking for her, she had gone back to the place that we got separated and was looking for me too. And after I'd calmed down a little bit and we'd left the store, I remember she said something like, you know, remember our plan. Remember, I just need you to stay put. Stay where you are. Hold on to that. Let me read the next four verses of our psalm. Starting in verse four, it says this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Okay, so what is this river, and and what does it have to do with this idea of being still? To understand that, we have to quickly look at a little bit of the context of that verse and of this psalm. You see, when you see that phrase, city of God, I want you to think Jerusalem. That was another term for Jerusalem. And so, in the city of Jerusalem, it had become the capital of this nation, Israel. And Israel was surrounded by other nations and other groups of people, and many of them were not really happy that Israel had taken over this area and and had this city of Jerusalem. And when this psalm was written, there was no river in the city of God. In fact, Jerusalem had only one water supply, and it was outside of the city walls. And so if one of these enemies, one of these nations, decided to attack the city, all they would have to do is cut off that water supply and simply wait. And so when they sang about this river, when they sang about this idea of having this water supply, it was this idea of being promised life. It was this beautiful concept for them, just as important to have this water as it was to have the strongest army and the highest walls. Even beyond this psalm, we see water consistently associated with God's presence and protection throughout his word. You can see just a few examples up on the screen, and I could have picked many more, but but each one of these associates God with this idea of still waters, or this river of living water, as John 7 calls it. God is associated with water, and water is associated with life. Our psalm is painting this picture, continuing the contrast between the waters raging and foaming and the seas roaring outside of the city, and this quiet river of life providing them with exactly what they need. Maybe you're like me in the nights where it's raining or storming outside or the nights that you sleep the best, and there's something about just hearing that rain and yet being completely protected. It's just so peaceful. That's the promise that we see in verse 5 when it says God is in the midst. God is in the midst even when storms surround us. His peace and his presence is still there. I wonder, though, if maybe you've gone through a time or you're currently going through a time where you just start to question if that's true for you. Maybe you read this part about the nations raging and the earth melting, and you're like, yeah, that's my reality. But then we read that God is in the midst, that he's with us, he's our fortress. And and to be honest, doesn't it seem like sometimes God is the one that's still? Maybe you've come here today, that's part of your story in this season. And you read God is in the midst, but then why don't I hear his voice? Why don't I feel his presence? This river of life seems to have dried up for me. My answer to that question, a question I've asked myself in my own life, is that the story of the Bible, the story of God and his people teaches us that just because God is silent, that doesn't mean he's still. Just because he is silent, that doesn't mean he is still. And sometimes I think we do the same thing that I did in the grocery store as a young child. And as soon as we stop hearing his voice and feeling his presence, we think that he has left us. And we start trying to do everything on our own, and we wonder why it's not going our way. But he has given us the plan to trust in him and to be still. To trust in him and to be still. There's a reason that this verse that we see, verse 7, 
declaring the God of Jacob is our fortress is in this psalm twice. We'll see it again in verse 11. It's the chorus of this song, the the refrain that they would sing over and over again. You see, there there was an importance to it to remind us that when we are struggling, that when we can't hear his voice, when we feel far from God, one of the greatest things that we can do is to look back at what he has already done. To remember the promises that he has made in our lives and in those around us and those that have come before. You see, everyone that wrote and sang this song would have known the promise that God made to Jacob. We can see it in Genesis 35. It's not on the screen, but let me just read it to you this morning. God says this to Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. See, this is why God of Jacob is referred to in this psalm, because the people singing this for the first time were the embodiment of that promise coming true. They were that nation. They were those people. They were the promise that God made that even after being enslaved in famines and wars and against every odd, God proved himself to be true. And so if you've come here and and maybe you're in that season, maybe you feel that way, maybe that needs to be your cry as well. That God, I believe your promises are true. I believe your word is true. And just like this river of life, that you will give me exactly what I need. I believe that your grace is unending. That your peace is beyond my understanding. That your love is perfect for me. God is our refuge. He is our river. And last, he is our rest. He is our rest. Have you ever realized that you were fighting a losing battle? I remember the, the summer before my freshman year of high school, I signed up to uh, join our high school's summer basketball camp. And so it was for freshmen through seniors. And I remember I showed up the first day, and I was the shortest and smallest person there. So I was like, cool, good start. And I'm looking up, and there's some seniors there, and they're like grown men, and you know, they're talking about like facial hair and retirement accounts and calculus, and it's just super intimidating to me. And there's one guy, he was going to be the the starting center of our varsity team. He was at least 6'5", which to me basically meant he was a mountain. Like he was, I was just looking up to him in awe. And so each day at the camp, they would end the day by putting everyone's name into a basket, and they would pick two names out to play one-on-one in front of the entire camp. And you already know where this story is going, right? (laughs) The first two names, me and the mountain man. And so we go out, and and literally everyone's just around us watching us play, and he's kind of laughing because it just looks ridiculous. He's at least a foot taller than me, and he gives me the ball first, probably out of pity, And as soon as I get the ball, I just throw it up towards the basket. Swish. Two nothing. He's like, okay, he got lucky or something. So he gives me the ball again, and I do the exact same thing. Four nothing. And the entire camp is just silent. And everyone is shocked, and I'm shocked, but this is like the greatest moment of my life. Like, I've read David and Goliath, but now I'm living David and Goliath, and (laughs) You know, I got hoop dreams. I'm going to make the varsity team. And, and, and I get the ball again, and I go up, and I go for a layup. And this mountain man blocks my shot so hard, I think I lost my breath a little bit. And he took the ball, and he comes back, and he dunks it right over me. And he lands, and he looks down at me, and he just stares. And right then I knew I was fighting a losing battle. And I didn't score another point and I never played basketball again. No, I'm just kidding. See, the people reading and hearing this psalm knew what it was like to fight a losing battle, one much greater than a one-on-one game at summer camp. The people of Israel had fought countless enemies and countless battles that they had no business winning, fighting enemies far more powerful than they. And the fact that Israel not only survived but found victory in the promised land shows us the power of our God. And so it's with that in mind that this psalm ends. Let me read verse 8 through 11 for you. It says that, that we should come and behold the works of the Lord, 
how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We see this verse that I mentioned earlier, this verse that sounds so calm and peaceful the first time we hear it, to, to be still and to know that I'm God. But what if these words are more about slowing down and finding quiet time in your life? See, it's not enough to simply be still. It's about being still and knowing that he is God, that he is the one that will be exalted. And as we read about this in the entirety of its psalm, knowing this God means knowing a God that is a fortress, that is strength, that is the Lord of hosts. This title of God, Lord of hosts, refers to this army of angels at God's command. This is language of, of battle, of war. In fact, it's the same language used by David in 1 Samuel 17 when he's about to fight Goliath. He says this to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. See, the God that brought victory to a young boy against a giant is the same God that this song is about in the same context that we hear this command to be still. This command to be still is not only a reminder for us to, to find our rest in him, but it's also a warning to those who oppose him. A reminder for us of the, the stakes that we're playing with. That there will be a time that those who make themselves an enemy of God will see what he is capable of. See, when God tells us to be still and to know that he's God, it's more about quiet time. He is speaking into the battles of your life. He's speaking into things like fear and anxiety. He's speaking into things like sin and addiction, into things like brokenness, the very things that we seek refuge from. But remember, we don't have to find refuge. Refuge has found us. And the God that gave David the power to defeat a giant is the same God who wants to fight for you. And his command to be still is a command to stop fighting on our own. Because our power doesn't come from our strength, and it doesn't come from our struggling. It comes from our stillness. From remembering who he is and what he is capable of. As we've been reading, if you've been looking on the screen, you may have noticed this italicized word, Selah. This was another musical instruction for those that were singing it, indicating a time to pause and reflect on what was just sung, to worship God in the stillness of a song. Well, I wonder what would happen in your life and in mine if we took the time to do the same thing, to say every day I want to pause and worship the God who fights for me and to ask him to speak into and step into the battles of my life to ask him to equip me with what I need because stillness doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything. It simply means that we are not the source of our victories, that he is our strength. He is our refuge. He equips us for battle, and in him I will rest. I think back to my basketball game as a 14-year-old with a dream, and the truth is I was never going to win that game. I wasn't tall enough or strong enough or talented enough, and, and after the mountain man scored about 10 points in a row off of me, I was pretty much ready to quit. I just wanted to go home. But imagine if, after getting dunked on for the third time in front of the whole team, I looked over and I saw LeBron James standing on the sideline. And he came up to me and said, hey, I got this. Let me play for you. And he stepped in, and compared to him, our starting center would look like a child. And together, together, we would have won that game. Friends, that's exactly what it means to be still. And the truth is, so many of us have come here today, and we've been fighting something for so long, and it seems so big to us. And maybe you're the only one that knows about it. And God is right there saying, let me fight for you. 
Stop fighting on your own. Be still. Give up this control that you think you have, and maybe today you need to remember who your God is. That your God is the God of Jacob, whose promises are always true. That your God is the Lord of hosts who breaks the bow and shatters the spear of his enemies. And the more we rest in him, the greater the victory will be in our lives. That is the place that stillness has in your life. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the truth that is in your word that you are our refuge. God, that you give us life in ways that we don't expect but that we always need. And that we can rest in your word, in your truth, in your promises that always come to bear. Father, I ask those of us that have come in here today and we're fighting a storm and our life seems like it's in chaos, Lord, would you surround us with peace today? And would you remind us that in our own strength, we have nothing, but with you, we do have that victory. The victory is in your name, in faith in your goodness. God, would you fill us with that now? We love you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.